I'd expect God to manifest in front of me and be able to reliably do something miraculous, such as raising the dead, or even being able to show me firsthand the birth of a new universe. I mean, we're dealing with omnipotence here. I doubt this would be too much trouble when your power and abilities are limitless and infinite. I'd expect the world to be free from suffering, assuming this is a benevolent God, of course. That would be some of my expectations. Um, it's just as I said in my other video. You're expecting the all-powerful creator of the universe to bow down to you and dance before you as your puppet. The only God you want to believe in is one that bends to your will, and that's very telling. It shows your rejection of God comes from an attitude of arrogance rather than humility. God will not be tested by you. The mere fact that God decides not to make it easy for you does absolutely nothing to show that he does not exist. We have more than enough compelling reasons to accept that God does exist, and he expects us to humble ourselves in faith to cross that gap between what is reasonable and what is certain. And again, with regards to your expectation of the world being free from suffering, ignores the fact that suffering itself has a purpose in God's plan and is a result of human free will, which is logically incompatible with there being no possibility of evil. The ironic thing, though, is this. God did come to earth and raise the dead before the eyes of men. It's recorded in the letters of the New Testament, whose writers were willing to be tortured and killed for what they claimed to have witnessed. You should read it sometime. Furthermore, I haven't heard a single argument from a scientist that says that the universe has always existed in its current state. This sounds like a complete and utter straw man. Well then, unsurprisingly, you haven't done your homework. Do a simple Wikipedia search on static universe. Until the work of Einstein made it impossible to ignore, even though he himself tried, most cosmologists believed in a static, eternally unchanging universe. To say that the universe had a beginning directly implies that it had a cause, a creator, and they didn't want to acknowledge that. I've heard Hawking, if I read correctly, say that the universe as we know it had a beginning, but that doesn't mean that the universe could ha couldn't have existed in some way, some form, beforehand. Just because the universe was not as we know it right now doesn't mean it was created. It simply means that there was a point in history in which the universe would be unrecognizable to us as the universe. If the universe suddenly jumped into existence a finite time ago, which is what Big Bang cosmologists like Hawking believe, then the question of what caused that to happen cannot possibly be ignored. Events need a cause. I have no innate desire to worship a higher power. Furthermore, let's say that it was true that humans do have innate desires for worship. I think it could be better explained that atheists and heathens were killed and taken out of the gene pool, at least openly atheistic people, throughout history. Wouldn't then belief be a selective factor in the human gene pool? The desire to worship something doesn't mean the something you worship is really there. Well, even if what you say is true and you do not innately desire to worship anything, something that I highly doubt, you are in the vast minority of humanity. Nearly all people in all time periods have believed in the supernatural and in a god or gods. If you come up with a story of how this can be explained in terms of evolution, that's just fine. But this is just one competing explanation. Another completely viable explanation is that we were created intentionally with the desire to know our Creator. Since there are so many other reasons to believe that a Creator does in fact exist, this would seem to be the much preferred explanation of the two. People can be scared of death. That's a reason for one to want immortality. If death were completely and totally natural and normal, why would we be afraid of it? We aren't afraid of other natural, normal things, like gravity, for example, or eating food. So why this? Why would we not react just as casually to death as to any other normal part of reality? The fact that we naturally hate things like suffering and death is strong evidence that these are unnatural aberrations. That is exactly what the Bible teaches, incidentally, that God created a world that was free of suffering and death and that they were introduced only as a curse, a punishment, for the sin of humanity. No one in this world is born into it with knowledge that a God in fact exists. Everyone got their knowledge of God from someone else, whether that be their parents, friends, or whatever. 
This claim is false and does not square with current scientific research. I'm going to link a couple of articles on the screen that deal with this topic and leave it at that. The scientific evidences are not scientific. Bring those to qualified scientists in their respective fields, such as irreducible complexity of life to biologists, and see what happens. All you're doing here is showing your anti-theistic bias, which runs contrary to scientific evidence. Many scientists are theists, and a growing number of scientists, even experts in biology, are questioning and rejecting Darwinian theory for a myriad of scientific reasons. See in my other videos dealing with Darwinism for more on this, or even better, watch Ben Stein's documentary, Expelled. As for the arguments presented, such as Kalam, at best a deist god. The Kalam cosmological argument is valid, but you're correct. It only brings us to a very vague concept of God. Cult worshippers are also willing to die for their beliefs, and you reject their claims. You, sir, have a double standard. If it's your God and your martyrs, then of course it's true. If it's someone else's God and someone else's martyrs, then they're deluded and misguided. The difference is that the founders of Christianity, the disciples of Christ, died for something they would have personally known to be either true or false. They were making claims of what they personally witnessed, not merely having faith in the claims of others as present-day martyrs do. No one has ever given me any kind of coherent explanation of why all these men would have submitted to horrendous torture and death for something they knew was a lie. No one does that. And that's all for my responses.